imagine if all of the wine in the world was made from just one grape. Let's say Merlot. 90% of the wine made from one grape from one part of the world sent to a few industrial chocolate makers to be made into a beverage that we all associate with the flavor of wine. Maybe the other 10% are some independents in there exploring different varietals, the hundreds of different varietals of wine out there. But for the most part, when we thought wine, we thought this one flavor. This is what it's like in the chocolate industry at the moment. This $100 billion industry is dominated by one type of bean, the Forastero bean. The Forastero grown in a, in a couple of countries, mostly West Africa, and sent to industrial chocolate makers where it's made into a product that we all come to associate with chocolate. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can't make great wine from Merlot or that the Ivory Coast and Ghana don't produce beautiful chocolate. All I'm suggesting is that there's a whole world of chocolate out there, and it's incredible. Anywhere 10 degrees north or south of the equator, you can grow cacao, and there are hundreds of different strains to discover. I first had my first real bean-to-bar craft chocolate. A friend brought over a bar from a San Francisco chocolate factory called Dandelion Chocolate, and they'd made this chocolate bar right from the bean, beans that they sourced from Madagascar. This chocolate bar just had two ingredients, 70% beans, 30% sugar, and nothing else. So I snapped off a couple of squares, popped them in my mouth, and a few moments later, a party started. <laughs> Candied strawberry, black forest, plum, all these incredible flavors that I had no idea existed in chocolate. So I had to look at the wrapper, and sure enough, it was just 70% organic Madagascan beans and 30% sugar. The flavors I was tasting had to have been coming from the bean itself. Up until this moment, I thought I was in the serious chocolate business. And I do have a good chocolate business, which is, uh, started in 2004 and still going strong, selling in the UK and Australia and New Zealand. But my ego was somewhat undone by these two squares of chocolate. I had a little pang of imposter syndrome, so phase two of my chocolate journey started. After 13 years in Melbourne, I decided to pack up and try and find the best cocoa beans in the world. This led me, my heart actually led me to Peru. It was here, up the Sacred Valley, that I visited a cocoa farm for the first time. Meeting this family and working th walking through their organic food forest was a deeply inspiring and life-changing experience. It was here in Peru that I tried my first fresh cocoa bean straight from the pod. This cocoa bean, th this is the pod, there's the beans that are in there and this white pulp is beautifully sweet around it. This is the highest quality varietal in the world. This is what they call the Criollo. So there's the Forastero, which in coffee terms is like Robusta, and then the Forastero, oh, sorry, the Criollo, which in coffee terms I suppose is more like the Arabica. Um, this is a Criollo Porcelano organic uh, cocoa bean. So it's deliciously sweet and aromatic. It was here in Peru that I also made my first chocolate bar from the bean and learnt the process, and it was pretty awful. <laughs> After some more fact-finding and traveling around, visiting other bean-to-bar chocolate makers, and by bean-to-bar, I mean a small craft chocolate maker that makes the entire chocolate from getting the beans in, roasting them, hand-sorting them, right through to the finished product under one roof, rather than buying industrial blocks of chocolate or buttons to melt to make other things, which is the skill of a chocolate chocolatier, uh, we are chocolate makers make it from the bean to that point. I decided to move back to my hometown of Wellington with, a, with an ambition to open New Zealand's first open to the public, fair trade and organic chocolate factory. At this time, I was lucky enough to meet master chocolate maker Rochelle Harrison. Rochelle had been researching the art and science of making chocolate from the bean since before it became trendy. And we decided to team up and together we opened, in December, just gone, the Wellington Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Here you can walk in and you can see the entire process. 
From where the beans arrive to carefully hand sorting, grinding, there's Ash pouring the cocoa nibs into the grinder, molding, the whole process from bean to bar. We're proud to offer that level of transparency. There's no secret or magic to making good chocolate. It's simply sourcing great beans and you'll make a great chocolate bar. There's no need to add a lot of flavors because every bean has their own unique characteristics. So, hands up here who hasn't tried a freshly roasted cacao bean? Most of you, that's great. Okay, so this is where the mystery packages come in. This sounds a little bit like a bad magic trick, but it's not. It could be. So if you just... Look at all that rustling. So what you'll find in here... is three items. You'll find a cocoa bean, which I'd like you to bring out now. And this bean here is one of those Criollo beans from Peru, the highest quality in the world. So we're going to taste this. If you're feeling adventurous, you can have the whole thing, the shell and all, uh, or you can do both. You crack it like this inside are what we call the cacao nibs, and then now you've got a mixture of the shell and the nib. It's very good for you. It's, it's like a, one of the actual legitimate superfoods. It's amazing for your health. It's a little bit bitter, a little bit sour. It's perfect. So you can, close, you can quite quickly see that this is, where, this is where all good chocolate comes from. This is the, the base of what we make a great chocolate bar from, but I'm not feeling adventurous today, so I'll just put the rest of mine over there. So, has everybody had a go tasting their first cacao bean? Great. All right, the next one I'm going to ask you to do is pull out the packet with the gold sticker. This one here is that very same bean with a little bit of sugar made into chocolate. So we've not added anything to it, it's just the Peruvian cacao bean. So here's the gratification. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> so there's a lot of different flavors in there. There's maybe a bit of fruitiness, a bit of apricot character. But that's just the natural flavor of that bean. Now, I wanted to produce, to, to include one more chocolate, which is a contrasting chocolate, and just wanted to say that we didn't change anything in the making of this next chocolate you're about to taste. The only thing that's changed is the country that it was grown and the varietal that it is. So this is a Trinitario bean grown in the, in the Caribbean, so we're going 3,000 kilometers north. And you'll notice, you may notice it's a little darker than the first one. It's got a rich, dark, earthy flavor. A little bit of citrus marmalade, malt. It's amazing how different it is, just being from two different strains of cacao, from two different parts of the world that aren't actually that far away from each other. Hmm. <laughs> so now... The cocoa industry is facing a little bit of a problem at the moment. There's going to be, there is a looming supply issue. So, as I mentioned, 90% of the world's cacao is Forestero beans. And there, there's, there's a, a number of issues facing uh, West Africa at this point. One of the many issues is, is that the younger people are finding it unviable to carry on the family farm. There's a lot more opportunity for them in the major centres, so there's going to be less people there to produce the cocoa for the industrial cho chocolate makers. So what they're doing is, to mitigate this, is proliferating the lesser known cocoa growing regions with this one type of bean. And that's going to threaten strains, and it's going to limit our opportunity to find new and interesting flavors to explore. I witnessed this firsthand recently on a trip to Bougainville, which is just off the coast of Papua New Guinea. I noticed that they've got a clone that they've created, which is high yielding, pest resistant, 
uh, loads of uh, beans per hectare. In one sense, they're putting a lot of education and money into educating the farmers to streamline their operations, which can be a good thing, but ultimately, it's the industrial chocolate makers that are doing this so that they can continue to pay a low price and the workers will ultimately work very hard for very little return. While I was in Bougainville, I met a Coco legend. Some refer to him simply as Mr. Coco. He's been in the industry for 40 years. His name is Mr. James Rutana. And the guy to my left is his neighbour. His name is Gary, and he is a cocoa farmer. He's originally from New Zealand, but has been in Bougainville for 30 years now. So James has had an incredible 40 years of cocoa. He planted his first tree in 1958. He was, a, he was appointed chairman of the Papua New Guinea Cocoa Board in 1975. James has worked in the industry in New York, Ghana, Jamaica. He's represented Papua New Guinea Cocoa in England, and Gary tells me on a couple of occasions he's even sat at the Queen's table and had dinner. James decided to move back to his homeland to start a cocoa plantation of his own, which employed 300 people locally, and then devastating war broke out in 1990. James and his family fled to the Solomon Islands and returned in 2002 once the war was over. He's been rebuilding ever since. We had a cup of tea in his training shed, and he was talking to me about how he's about to give up. It's been too hard. Uh, these big businesses have left him by the wayside, taken a lot of his knowledge, um, from what I can tell, and he's feeling disheartened. Regardless of the quality of his beans, he'll get $3 per kilo, which is not very much. $3 US, roughly. So regardless of the varietal or the quality, it all gets put into the same vat to make our confectionery, which you know a lot of people consider as chocolate, but chocolate is a food. My name is James Rutano. I'm a owner of this plantation here. It's a small, small estate plantation, about 100 hectares. Um, I mainly plant cocoa trees on this plantation. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at exploring into another areas of markets. One of the areas I'm looking at is to find a better price for my cocoa that I produce on, on the plantation. Um, I'm very excited at this point of time when, um, if I can work with Wellington Chocolate, is it? Yeah. Factory. Uh, Wellington Factory. Wellington Factory. I'm very interested and excited about working with uh, Wellington Factory. Um, I know there's a lot of goods can be shared in between the between us and Wellington Chocolate Factory. Um, and I'm, I'm very keen to uh, continue working on the cocoa plantation to see if I can get a better price for my cocoa beans. <laughs> As we finished our cup of tea, James and I launched a bit of a crazy plan. Early next year, we aim to find a sailing boat where we can sail the, the first shipment of two tons of beans directly from Bougainville into Wellington Harbour. And I hope many of you here tonight can be there to welcome James and the rest of us to help shed a positive light on Bougainville and to showcase the autonomous reg region of Bougainville as a world-class cocoa-growing region. This might just help. It, it, uh, cocoa is their main export, so it's very important to them that they get a good price for their cocoa. I hope that one day, like wine, many of us have our favourite origin of chocolate, our favourite varietal, and our favourite chocolate makers. I'm looking forward to growing older, by which stage I'll know what my, be closer to knowing what my favourite flavours are. And like James, who knows what adventures lie just around the corner. Thank you.